Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my history series where today we're going to be covering the Satanic Panic. I'm sure a huge amount of you have heard of the Satanic Panic before, you'll know at least the basics, but today we're going to do a deep dive into what it was, what caused it and why it happened. This wasn't just a case of a few religious people being worried about the devil. This was a widespread moral panic throughout North America, specifically in the USA and Canada, in which rumours of satanic ritual abuse spread like wildfire. Across the USA, baseless conspiracy theories led to even the most rational of people believing stories of daycare workers conducting satanic rituals and sacrificing children, people believing that companies were acting as agents of Satan, trying to infect the minds of the country via subliminal messaging and satanic symbols in their advertising. People 100% believed that satanic cults were rife across America, despite there never being an ounce of actual evidence that any of this was happening. People went to prison because of this, lives were ruined due to unbelievable crime at the hands of satanic cults. Let's explore how this came to happen and how many people never quite got over this mindset. You can still speak to people today who fully believe in these stories, but luckily the majority of people did get over the panic eventually. Although you can go to pretty much any country around the world and find people who believe in Satan, that's not what this was about. But what was it that made the USA and parts of Canada so susceptible to this panic in the first place? I think we need to head back a few hundred years to get our answer there, way back to the Puritans. In the early 17th century, thousands of English Puritans colonised North America, focusing mainly in the area of New England. After years of battling between Protestants and Catholics, Elizabeth I took the crown in 1558 and one of her first royal actions was to establish the English Protestant Church. But Elizabeth had a bit of a reputation as being way too soft, she never really stood up for much and she didn't restore the church quite enough for some of the strictest English Protestants, the strictest of the Christians. Puritans followed the word of the Bible to the letter and they rejected the devil who they believed to be at every single corner, just waiting to lure you off the path of God. When the English Protestant church stopped being strict enough for the Puritans, a huge amount of Puritan people boarded ships to the New World, what we now know as the USA. These were some of the very first English colonies on the land and they would become the beginning of the country as it is today. The population of the USA is hugely built on the Puritans, the most religious of people. So it makes sense that the country is still fairly religious today. Just over a century after the Puritans started arriving in New England, the Salem witch trials happened in Massachusetts, which just like the Satanic Panic, is also often attributed to moral panic and mass hysteria. We've all heard of the Salem Witch Trials, right? A series of hearings of prosecutions in the late 1600s, when more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft. 30 of them were found guilty and 19 were executed. Contrary to popular belief, they were not executed via burning on the stake, but instead by hanging. The witch trials came about thanks to a fear that Satan, the devil, had overtaken the bodies and minds of members of the community. So this fear of Satan, of evil, runs so deep in the USA. Fast forward a few hundred years and the country remains pretty Christian. But in the second half of the 20th century, there's a shift in attitude. The 60s were the birth of free love, the hippie movement, young adults wanting more than the conservative and religious views thrust upon them by their parents. But at the same time, perhaps in response or perhaps not, there was also a revival and a huge growth of evangelism and modern Christian fundamentalism. In response, pop culture begins to rebel against the religious binary and starts to show a fascination with the paranormal. 
1971, William Peter Blatty released his novel, The Exorcist, which just two years later was adapted into a movie. If you haven't seen it, it's a tale of demonic possession and it will give anyone, me, a lot of nightmares. Just a couple of years before this, the horror film Rosemary's Baby had told a similar story, in which a young woman finds out that her elderly neighbours are members of a satanic cult. Over the coming years there would be the Amityville Horror, The Omen, Carrie, The Hills Have Eyes, just to name a few. There was this surge of cult classic horror movies in the 70s, and the sort of theme of all of them was demonic possession. People became terrified of being possessed. And this time was also full of real life horrors as well. In 1969, Charles Manson and his Manson family doomsday cult were responsible for the murders of four people. The year before that, at the People's Temple in Guyana, probably known to you as Jonestown, over 900 people were found dead in a mass suicide slash mass murder. Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, the son of Sam, the Zodiac Killer, they were all alive and active in the 70s. There's no denying that evil really was taking the headlines throughout this time. If you did believe in the devil, then you really might think that he was making an appearance on Earth through these people. America was scared. And it was around this same time that Anton LaVey founded his Church of Satan and wrote the Satanic Bible, which despite how provocative that title is, it's really just a collection of observations, essays and rituals. It's important to note here that I'm talking specifically about LaVey and Satanism here, a non-theistic religion, it doesn't believe in a god and by that standard, nor would actually believe in the actual figure of Satan as Christianity would do. Practices of Levian Satanism do not believe in the existence of Satan and do not worship him. The symbol of Satan is just embraced in defiance of Abrahamic religions. But not to let that get in the way of outrage, you can imagine that the existence of a satanic bible created a whole lot of worry within the Christian communities. It was very provocative. All of which, I think, sets a very nice background to understand how the satanic panic came to be in the 1980s. How it was this uniquely American panic. But if you think it came out of the USA, you'd be wrong, because the real origin of the satanic panic can actually be traced to Canada, with a 1980 book called Michelle Remembers, written by a Canadian psychiatrist called Lawrence Pazda and his patient, Michelle Smith, who it seems would actually later become his wife. The book was a biographical account of the abuse Michelle Smith allegedly experienced at the hands of her mother during the 1950s in British Columbia, Canada. She'd originally gone to see psychiatrist Lawrence Pazda after suffering with depression following a miscarriage, but through the controversial technique of regression hypnosis, he recovered a series of repressed memories in which it turns out Michelle had been the victim of abuse abuse specifically of a satanic cult throughout her entire childhood. Through this hypnosis, Michelle suddenly remembered her abusive upbringing, how she'd been imprisoned in cages with snakes and forced to watch as members of her mother's satanic cult slaughtered kittens in front of her. And she also said she had 81 consecutive days of abuse as they tried to summon Satan. This was a Church of Satan, but a different Church of Satan than LaVey's, which I mentioned previously, although that distinction might only have been made after LaVey actually sued Pazda. According to Pazda, this particular Church of Satan was centuries old. Michelle claimed that she was eventually saved from this cult by Jesus and the Virgin Mary themselves who appeared to her. For years, nobody really questioned any of the claims that Michelle made. It was taken at face value, or at least it was taken at face value by the general public. In 1989, almost a decade after the publication of Michelle Remembers, she went on the Oprah Winfrey show where her experience was portrayed as fact. Nobody questioned it because why would somebody lie about such a thing? Perhaps Michelle even believed it herself. 
The book has since been completely discredited and Michelle's entire story, it turns out, was based on this very questionable recovered memory therapy. Hypnosis, guided imagery and sedative hypnotic drugs were used to help patients recall forgotten memories, based on this idea that traumatic memories can be buried in the subconscious. However, this recovery technique is no longer allowed as it's incredibly easy for a psychiatrist to guide their patients to saying what they want them to say, suggesting certain scenarios and planting false memories. But despite all of this, the book was an instant success and became a phenomenon across North America. Pasta and Smith went on a lengthy book tour across the USA and the media very rarely questioned how truthful the account really was, although experts were almost immediately able to thoroughly debunk her claims. But that doesn't matter though when it comes to a really good story for the media. In the following years there would be many copycat books with multiple people claiming similar stories, spreading the fear that the devil really could be anywhere just waiting to pounce. In the years that followed, Lawrence Pasdell would become a self-proclaimed expert in the area of satanic ritual abuse. Don't forget his name because he will be coming up again in this story. The effect that this book had on American society simply cannot be understated, because within just a couple of years, accusations began to be thrown around about the same type of satanic ritual abuse that Michelle reportedly went through happening specifically in daycare centres, for reasons that will become clear as I go through this video. The majority of sources pinpoint the first such daycare abuse case as being the Kern County case or Kern County witch hunt, when in the early 80s a woman called Mary Ann Barber claimed that her two step granddaughters had told her that they were being abused by their parents, Alvin and Debbie McEwen, and that their parents had also been part of a sex ring. After investigation, Mary Ann was given full custody of her step-granddaughters and soon, according to her, they started to make bizarre claims. The girls said they'd been hung from hooks from the ceiling and beaten with belts by their parents. The allegations kept escalating and the McEwens were arrested and so Alvin McEwen asked his friend Scott Niffen to serve as character witness on his behalf. In further interviews with the girls by the police, they started to claim that Scott and his wife Brenda were also involved in the same sex ring as their parents, and that their two sons had also been victims. So the Niffin boys were subsequently taken into custody themselves and interrogated. Through suggestion and being told they'd only be allowed to go home if they admitted to the abuse, eventually these young boys accused their parents of sexual abuse as well. In April 1982, the McEwens, the Niffins and several other residents of Kern County were arrested and charged with the abuse of the four children. And this is despite there being no evidence of any abuse apart from the children's words. In 1984, the adults were convicted and were given a combined sentence of more than 1,000 years in prison, and all appeals they made fell on deaf ears. Over the next few years, six similar cases happened in Kern County alone, in which many more people ended up in prison. There was a man called Roy Noakes who was accused of being in a satanic cult by his own grandson, and an article from the Los Angeles Times dated August 4th, 1985, reads, There are those, including Kern County Sheriff Larry Clear, who tend to believe the children's stories that Noakes and as many as 76 other adults were members of satanic child molestation rings that engaged in cannibalistic murders of infants. And there are those who, citing an admitted shortage of substantial corroborating evidence and obvious errors in the children's stories, tend to believe that Noakes and the others are victims of a massive witch hunt. At this time in Kern County, there was a 10-man task force dedicated to uncovering evidence of satanic abuse. They were looking for proof of cannibalism, blood rituals, murders, missing children, but they never found a thing. 
this was a new type of crime, it was something never really seen in modern America, and it was the kind of crime that prosecutors didn't even know how to prosecute. We're talking serious allegations of sexual abuse and much, much more coming from the children, and it was all handled completely wrongly from the get-go. It wouldn't be until 1996 that the McEwens and Niffins would eventually be released from prison, their convictions finally overturned, but they lost over a decade of their lives because of this. Not long after the current accusations started being thrown about, possibly the most famous trial of the Satanic Panic era happened, the McMartin Preschool Trial. If you've heard of anything in this video, it would be this, as it's one of the longest and most expensive criminal trials in American history. And some of the accusations made in this trial are completely beyond belief. The McMartin Preschool was a preschool operated by members of the McMartin family in Manhattan Beach, California, who in 1983 began to be accused of hundreds of acts of sexual abuse of children in their care. It began with a woman called Judy Johnson, whose three-year-old son Matthew attended the preschool, reported to the police that her son had been sodomised by one of the teachers, 28-year-old Ray Bucky. A huge accusation to make, but it turns even murkier when you find out that Ray Bucky was actually Judy's estranged husband. Judy, who was described as mentally unbalanced in some sources, was reportedly obsessed with her son's health and had become convinced there was an issue with his bowels. Instead of assuming it was something less nefarious, her mind immediately jumped to the idea that he'd been sodomised. She questioned Matthew extensively about his experience at the nursery, to which Matthew never mentioned anything of being mistreated, particularly by Ray. So Judy changes tact and questions Michael about whether he liked to play doctors and give people injections. She asked him if Ray had ever done that to him. He says no, but he does admit that Ray had taken his temperature before. Judy jumps on this as a disguised form of sexual abuse and immediately takes Matthew to the hospital for an examination. Judy also contacts the police and things get a bit conflicting from there. Seeing as this wasn't the first report in the country about daycare abuse in recent years, the authorities were apparently immediately determined to get to the bottom of what was going on. But remember this was Judy making all of the claims on behalf of her son, saying that he'd been photographed naked and tied up. All of the claims she made were taken at face value, they just assumed that she was telling the truth and that Matthew had told her all of this. She was told to take her son to specialists at the Children's Institute International, where they were seen at first by an inexperienced intern, who just again accepted Judy's word for what had happened with no real evidence of the claims she was making. The police started a full investigation into the preschool, and on the 7th of September 1983, Ray Bucky was arrested. But he was soon released, seeing as there was no actual evidence of anything untoward. However, after this point, people in the local community suddenly started to realise what an odd man he apparently was. No one had ever thought anything bad of Ray before, but now apparently he started to look at girls strangely or stared into space for long periods of time. He wore loose shirts and no underwear. The power of suggestion is a very strong thing. Once it had been suggested to parents that something was off with Ray, suddenly it became true in their minds. The police asked parents to ask their children about anything weird that Ray might have said or done whilst they were at preschool, and not a single child had anything to offer. With no evidence against Ray, the police used the school records to send letters to every single parent who had ever had a child in the daycare, that's 200 plus families. The letter stated that Ray was under investigation for suspected child molestation, spelling out the act so the parents were to question their children about. So the parents do just that, asking children leading questions about whether Ray had taken their photographs or games he'd played with them. 
Innocent children games the workers would play with the kids started to sound very ominous. The parents were obviously highly concerned about this letter they'd received from the police. They wanted answers and they wanted to find out if their kids had been affected. I mean, you'd want to know, wouldn't you, if it was your child? So parents kept pushing and pushing and pushing until the kids told them what they thought the parents wanted to hear, responding to the leading questions with the right answers. And then, in response to the attention they got, they began to embellish on these stories and even began to name other adults and children involved in the abuse. It sounds incredibly similar to what happened in the Salem Witch Trials, doesn't it? If you're not entirely clear on what happened there, I'll leave the video linked up here and down below. The authorities urged the parents to document all stories, find out as much as they possibly could. The parents of kids who hadn't said anything were told that their kids had been named by others and they were told not to take no for an answer, to keep digging for stories. Several hundred of these children were also interviewed by the Children's Institute International using highly suggestive interview techniques. This whole idea of recovered memories was the latest rage in therapy circles, so a huge focus was on recovering repressed memories that didn't even exist in all these children in the first place. Everything the children said in their therapy sessions and to parents was taken as gospel, except when it wasn't what the interviewers wanted to hear. When the children denied abuse, they were told that they weren't being as cooperative as their friends, that they weren't as smart as their friends. And if a kid's being told that, sooner or later they're going to start making stories up so that adults think they're smart. The director of this institute was an unlicensed psychotherapist called Key McFarlane, and she is the one who developed the concept of an anatomically correct doll for children to use during interviews concerning abuse. We all know the whole like point to where he touched you on the doll thing. It was claimed by spring 1984 that 360 children had been abused at the McMartin preschool. And at the same time that all of this was happening, there was also a political race going on for the re-election of the district attorney. The current DA, Robert Philibosian, was losing and he needed to get voters' attention. He saw the McMartin case as an opportunity and launched his own independent investigation. The assistant DA had close links with the Children's Institute, so it was actually her who was urging parents to take their children there. So essentially this whole trial happened because the DA wanted to get re-elected and he needed some attention on his name. This case was obviously similar to the Kern County case, which started with accusations of sexual abuse and then became something more satanic with cults and rituals. So I do think this was an idea in the back of people's minds the whole time. And as time went on, the accusations made by the children started to become more and more bizarre. You're talking children here, you're pushing them to give adult stories that get them attention with overactive imaginations and soon the stories start to overlap with stories of satanic ritual abuse, or at least that's what adults read into them. Some children started to claim that they saw witches fly, that they'd been taken in a hot air balloon and spoke of being taken in tunnels underneath the preschool to other locations for rituals. And the words of these kids were taken so seriously that there were actually several excavations to find these tunnels underneath the preschool. Of course they didn't exist, but they were looking for tunnels used to transport children to satanic rituals. It was around this time that Judy said her son had seen a live baby beheaded whilst at daycare and had also seen Ray Bucky fly. As the case went on, Judy Johnson made increasingly bizarre claims, things that Matthew had reportedly told her. He was apparently forced to ride horses naked on the beach, that Ray tortured and killed animals and wore odd costumes as he did this abuse. The female teachers dressed as witches and buried Matthew in a coffin and gave him an enema. Judy pushed it just about as far as she could, and people believed every word. 
A few of the children said they'd been taken to cemeteries where they'd watch staff dig up coffins and cut up the corpses. They made claims of orgies at car washes and airports and of children being flushed down toilets where they would be abused, cleaned up and then presented back to their parents at time for pickup. Of course, these claims are so far removed from reality. Being flushed down toilets, that literally isn't something that can happen. But you know what can explain things like that? Not overactive children's imaginations, of course, but Satan. The fact that there was no evidence to back up any of these claims literally just didn't matter to investigators at all. Their priority was believing the children. And this is important, right? If a child comes to you claiming abuse, you're going to be a terrible person if you don't believe it. How could you live with yourself if you told your child they were lying and it turned out to be true? Children just didn't make things up like this. You've got to look at the wider context to understand why these parents and the authorities were so willing to just accept what each child was saying. They probably didn't realise at the time they were asking leading questions. I've seen lots of speculation online about why all this happened, but I think you're coming off of decades of the whole children should be seen and not heard kind of mentality, when nobody would listen to the children. The parents of these children and their parents before them may have been raised in this way, children should be seen and not heard, sit down, shut up. And it's likely that when they had their own children, this was a generation that vowed to make a difference. You're coming off of the back of free love and hippie movement. Communication and actual relationships with your children were more important in the 80s and the 70s than they ever really had been before. And thanks to the feminist movement in the late 70s and early 80s, more women were working outside of the home than ever before. Women were going into the office, they had jobs. This meant that the daycare industry had boomed and mothers had a lot of anxiety and guilt about leaving their young children with strangers. They projected their own fears onto their kids. And we've already covered the suggestibility of children. Children just want to please their caregivers and adults in general. They want to say the right thing and make them happy. Children are very adept at reading body language and tone. They can sense when they're saying the right thing and the wrong thing. For a long time, child sexual abuse was something ignored by the American legal and medical systems. It was something completely hidden from the general population. People just couldn't really believe that others could be twisted enough to hurt children in such a way. But by the 70s and 80s, with widespread media and increased communication, people became aware that this really was something that happened. There were people out there who wanted to hurt kids. And all of this together just created this melting pot where adults were so eager to believe the children. The children wouldn't lie about such a thing. Outside of the satanic panic, any child accusing any adult of sexual abuse or abuse in any form should be listened to, of course, but the context surrounding the panic is really important. These kids were saying what they thought people wanted to hear and the adults were filling in the blanks. Eventually, in the McMartin case, seven people were arrested and charged with 321 counts of child abuse involving 48 children. Ray Bucky was obviously one of them, but also his sister, Peggy Ann Bucky, as well as his grandmother, Virginia McMartin, and his mother, Peggy McMartin, and other workers at the preschool as well. There were 20 months of preliminary hearings during which the children testified and the stories were increasingly bizarre and imaginative on the stand. It's said that both lawyers were at their wits end with the kind of evidence being allowed at the hearing, but the judge dismissed all objections. The case didn't actually reach trial until July 1987, by which time there had already been three full-time DAs 14 investigators from the DA's office, 22 task force officers, two full-time social workers, 20 part-time social workers, one full-time detective and four part-time detectives all assigned to this case. All of these people looking for literally any actual evidence of abuse. 
and not a single person found anything. But regardless, the trial steamed on ahead. In the end, only 11 children were presented at the trial, those who hadn't embarrassed the prosecution at the previous hearings, and the prosecution's entire trial rested on the interviews with these children at the Children's Institute. The whole thing was basically just this complete failure and an embarrassment for the DA's office. After three years of testimony, Ray Bucky was eventually cleared on 52 of 65 counts and he was freed on bail. He'd already spent five years in jail at this point and everyone else was acquitted. There was a second trial for Ray. He was retried on six of the 13 counts of which he was not acquitted in the first trial, but this second trial ended with a hung jury. The case was eventually just closed with all charges against him dismissed and this happened in the middle of the 1990s. So the bulk of the satanic panic had already passed, people just didn't really care anymore. And the real kicker here, Judy Johnson, who had started this whole thing, was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia during 1984, before the preliminary hearings even began and she ended up dying not long after. Judy had whipped up this frenzy and nobody thought to question it once it became clear that she had been diagnosed with a serious mental illness. In hindsight, this whole thing was clearly a case of mass hysteria, social contagion. I've only mentioned two of the daycare panics here, possibly two of the most important ones pertaining to the panic, but there were many, many more cases across the USA, Canada, and I even read about one case in the UK. People really and truly believe that satanic cults had infiltrated the children's preschools, and Lawrence Pasta, the psychiatrist and co-writer of Michelle Remembers, became somewhat of a self-proclaimed satanic abuse expert, and he would go across the country appearing at these trials as an expert, jailing people for something that didn't even exist. According to an article on Vox between 84 and 89, at least 26 people were sent to jail for convictions relating to satanic abuse of children, despite a complete lack of physical evidence for any of these claims. Since then, nearly all of these convictions have been overturned, but there was one man who served 20 years of a 40 year sentence. This fear of satanic ritual abuse obviously didn't stay within daycare slash childcare circles though. The media ensured that this was something that every single adult across America should be worried about. Priests who believed in satanic conspiracies held meetings with parents to educate them about the risk of child abuse and gave regular warnings to their congregations to be on the lookout. By the mid 80s, there were literally seminars, tutorials and educational videos for the authorities on the subject of recognising satanic cults. Law enforcement was sent to ritual crime seminars conducted by therapists, preachers and born again Christians who claimed to have survived said cults. But realistically, said cults didn't exist. It was purely hypothetical. The thought was that there were these tightly structured and secretive organisations all across North America and that the highest and most affluent members of society were in them, but there were apparently thousands of members overall. It was speculated that the police and the clergy were usually members, meaning that it was easy for the activities of said cults to go under the radar, it's how they got away with their rituals. And the ritual accusations were just as odd, with the killing ritual being central to the cult. Human and animal sacrifice happened really commonly. There were accusations of newborns being abducted from hospitals for rituals, there was obviously child sexual abuse and the consumption of sacrificial animal and human blood. People believed this was happening all across America and the lack of actual evidence wasn't enough to convince people otherwise. And it didn't help that even people like Oprah were giving believers a platform on their shows. Oprah hosted a whole episode on child sacrifice in 1989. Of course, she wasn't the only person giving a platform, but she's probably the only name on the list that people would recognise now, or at least I recognised. Also, I haven't seen this point made anywhere else, but I feel like it could be pertinent. 
This all happened obviously in the 80s in the USA, at the same time that the AIDS crisis was rife. The AIDS crisis in itself was judged as being a gay plague, punishment from God for the sin of homosexuality. All of the main news across North America at this time was related to Christianity. Heaven and hell, God and Satan, sin and punishment. I'm sure if I thought harder about this, I could come up with some sort of meaningful comment on the connection here, but I can't, it's just interesting to me. People were literally dying in their thousands across the country, but yet people were more concerned about an unproven conspiracy. You care about the child until they don't conform to your idea of what society should be, and then they're allowed to die. So we've explored the whole daycare thing in depth here. But of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there are a lot of other ways in which this panic manifested. We've probably all heard of the links before that people make between rock music or heavy metal music and Satanism. In 1985, the police actually raided what they called a cult house in Ohio and confiscated a whole load of rock music records, claiming that they promoted satanic activity. Musicians like Ozzy Osbourne and ACDC were accused of contributing to Satanism in the country. This narrative pushed further by evangelical documentaries which tied rock to the cult. I never really questioned why this type of music has been linked with Satanism before, I thought it was just kind of a given, but through writing this video I've realised that I only think it's a given because that's the narrative push during the panic and it's kind of stayed. Turns out that one of the actual reasons why rock slash metal music is linked with Satanism is because in the summer of 1984, a 17-year-old self-professed Satanist called Ricky Casso murdered his friend in New York whilst high on drugs. His friend Gary Lowers was stabbed 36 times and his eyes were sliced out, so the media suggested that this was a ritualistic killing. And Casso did actually tell his friends he did it because Satan told him to. He was eventually arrested, and on the day he was arrested, he was wearing an ACDC shirt, as well as being a heavy metal fan in general. It wasn't long until this association between this type of music and the murder was made in the media, and so the two have been intrinsically linked ever since. There was this big fear among society that heavy metal contained lyrics which encouraged people to do bad things, that they were poisoning the impressionable minds of teenagers. In 1985, a 20-year-old man actually tried to sue a band called Judas Priest when him and a friend shot themselves. The friend didn't survive, but he did, and he would go on to file a lawsuit claiming that he only shot himself because there was subliminal messaging within Judas Priest's Stained Glass album that pushed him to do it. Nothing would come of this lawsuit, of course, it was a load of rubbish. In 1985, a committee called Parents Music Resource Centre would make a playlist of songs they deemed inappropriate, and used it to push legislation for albums to come with a rating and or warning. Of course, the older generations being horrified with the music of younger generations isn't anything new. When Elvis came about in the 60s, parents were horrified at his sexual hip-rolling and suggestive lyrics. And in the 80s, it was rock music, metal music that created this kind of horror. There's always been this narrative that certain music pushes people to do certain things, that music is very highly suggestive. But then of course, in relation to the panic, there's Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, who was reportedly a huge fan of ACDC, and a lot of ACDC's music was blamed for the Night Stalker's actions, their song Night Prowler specifically accused of being an inspiration. There were a lot of things you can blame for Richard Ramirez and his actions. ACDC is probably fairly low on the list. And speaking as someone whose own father is a huge ACDC fan and was essentially raised on their music as well as Elvis's music, I think we can say that music is just music. I'm pretty well adjusted. It hasn't caused me to be anything in particular. It's just music. A huge thing was this idea of subliminal messaging, whether in songs or on TV, with some people claiming that playing certain songs backwards would reveal hidden satanic messages, urging listeners to do unspeakable things. And there were actual lawsuits looking into this, but it turns out 
it wasn't true. If you're listening out for certain words or phrases in the gibberish of a backwards song, you're gonna hear what you want to hear, that's the power of suggestion. But no actual proof of this was ever found. Other people would claim that split second messages would flash up on TVs during certain shows or adverts, pushing people to join the cults, but again, it's not proven. Even children cartoons weren't free from the accusations. In 1984, another documentary, there were a lot of evangelical anti-Satanism documentaries made in the 80s, called Turmoil in the Toy Box, gave this exhaustive list of children's programming that was projecting satanic ideals straight into your front room. According to an article on Vice, Star Wars was clearly magic, the force was akin to witchcraft. Scooby-Doo investigating the paranormal? satanic for obvious reasons. The Smurfs were blue with black lips, meaning they were clearly dead, and they were all male apart from Smurfette, so she was clearly transgender and that was very bad. E.T. was a secret occult movie and Thundercats was tied to ancient pagan symbolism and Hinduism it turns out, because apparently Hinduism is just as bad as being satanic, I'm not sure the leap there. Honestly, so many of these links with people just reaching, you could turn anything into negativity if you look hard enough. And people on the internet, believe me, they do that. <laughs> Even board games weren't free from the judgement. I mean, look at the Ouija board, which is now considered to be something that a lot of people won't touch, it's too risky to try and contact the paranormal. I mean, I'm a staunch atheist sceptic, and even I would pause before doing the Ouija board just because of the stigma around it. But did you know when the board was first created, it was just sold as a standard board game by Hasbro. It's things like the Satanic Panic that made it into what it is today. Many kids board games were blasted as having satanic undertones, and even the role playing game Dungeons and Dragons didn't avoid the satanic attack. In 1979, a 16-year-old boy prodigy called James Dallas Egbert III disappeared from his room at Michigan State University. His parents hired a PI who immediately believed that James's interest in Dungeons & Dragons was the reason behind his disappearance. It turns out that James just had some mental health problems, probably from the pressure of being a child genius, and had gone into hiding in the utility tunnels under the university. But then a couple of years later, in 1982, a high school student called Irving Lee Pulling committed suicide, and his mother said that his suicide was caused by him playing Dungeons and Dragons, that he didn't fit in anywhere. A game being associated with so much death surely means it has to be satanic, surely. And plus the whole premise of the game isn't very Christian. Dungeons and Dragons? Roleplay? Dressing up? No thank you. Clearly demonic worship. Even certain companies weren't able to escape the accusations. Procter and Gamble were accused of having links to the Church of Satan and that the logo apparently contained satanic symbols, after rumours started to spread that the president of the company had gone on an episode of Bill Donahue's talk show and admitted to both those things, admitted to being a worshipper of Satan. This was obviously in a time before being able to re-watch shows on demand and even being able to record shows was a thing. One woman from this small church in the middle of nowhere claimed that that's what she'd watched, she claimed that this guy had said that he worshipped Satan and she told her pastor. It ended up in the church newsletter and soon this rumour spread across the whole country. Spokespeople from P&G had to actually deny the rumours, and eventually after reviewing the footage, it was found that nothing about Satanism was ever said on the show, but by this point, it was too late. Once again, people don't want to let those pesky facts get in the way of their opinions. People are going to believe what they want to believe. P&G were even forced to change their logo from their classic moon and stars, because according to certain people, the moon resembled the number 6, and there were three distinct patterns in the 13 stars that created another series of three sixes, 666, clearly satanic, and the company were forced to change it. In April 1985, it was announced that the logo was going to be dropped permanently, but honestly, this just didn't help their cause. 
The next year, the Attorney General from South Dakota was forced to issue a press release to the state media, stating that no executive at PG had ever sold their soul to the devil, a genuine statement made by the company. The company ended up suing multiple people for slander and eventually it all sort of died down, but isn't it insane? There wasn't just one day where the satanic panic just came to an end, it just slowly tapered out of public consciousness. The media stopped reporting on it as much, people started to focus on other things, and eventually it just kind of passed. But in terms of damaging moral panic slash mass hysterias, this one is up there. So many people ended up in prison for literally no reason, they lost years of their lives. I'm not even going to begin to get into the famous West Memphis 3 case, as that could be a video all in itself. But basically in 1994, three teenagers were convicted of murder, and the whole premise of the trial was that they'd killed three boys as part of a satanic ritual. That's still a very controversial case, but a lot of people think there were simply three more victims of the satanic panic. A huge amount of the trial balanced on this angle, and the fact they listened to heavy metal music as well, apparently this was proof that they were troubled. In 1992, the Department of Justice published a monograph that thoroughly debunked any claims of systemic ritualistic occult abuse in America, written by a man called Kenneth Lanning, who looked at hundreds of cases and drew a conclusion that none of them showed proof of satanic abuse. He analysed how each different law enforcement agency had a different definition of what they considered Satanism to be, and offered alternative explanations for similarities amongst eyewitness accounts of abuse. This was the first time in 1992 that anyone objectively challenged the cases of ritual abuse. As is usually the case, some people believed him, some didn't. But by this point in the 90s, the panic had already started to die down and scepticism had taken over instead of just believing people at their words. Lanning's report also warned of the dangers of reducing complex issues of abuse into a simplistic narrative. That did more harm than good for anyone involved. According to psmag.com, he said, Although I did not realise it at first, I came to learn that the last of my key questions was actually the most significant. If something wasn't happening, why do so many intelligent, well-educated professionals believe it is? Regardless of intelligence and education, and often despite common sense and evidence to the contrary, adults tend to believe what they want or need to hear. The greater the need, the greater the tendency. There was a need to believe. In my opinion, the concept, more than any moral panic, was the foundation of satanic ritual abuse allegations. The need to believe the children even without corroboration. If you do not believe everything a victim alleges, what do you believe? It all came down to that in the end. People needed something to believe in. And the saddest thing is that although now impossible to prove, there's a chance that the abuse allegations that some of the hundreds or maybe thousands of children made were actually true. But they weren't investigated properly, they were assumed to be part of this satanic abuse, and everyone got thrown under the same bus. There may well have been children actually suffering, but the real perpetrators got away scot-free. It became very hard to separate the truth from the fantasy. Two years after the report was published, the federal government started to attempt to seek out the truth, still hoping to determine how widespread the problem of satanic ritual abuse really was. They obviously knew it wasn't as bad as it was made out to be in the 80s, but was it still an issue that needed addressing? The National Centre on Child Abuse and Neglect commissioned a study to assess the claims of abuse being made by clinicians across the country, and to question children's reliability as witnesses in the criminal justice system. The responses of 6,910 mental health professionals across the USA were examined, and it was found that roughly one third of those had accounted occult or religious-based abuse cases. Which is an important distinction to make, we're not just talking about satanic abuse here, but religious abuse in general, it all sort of came under the same umbrella. Most clinicians who said they had come across it had only come across one or two cases in their career, whilst 1.4% of the number states that they'd reviewed hundreds of cases like this. 
And this is where the definition of satanic abuse comes in again. If you're religious and think that all bad things are by definition satanic, then any bad act would qualify for you as satanic abuse. But that doesn't mean it's satanic ritual abuse, the cults of humans in league with the devil. It's a very important distinction to make. And a lot of the children involved in the original accusations came forward decades later saying they'd been pressured into saying the things they said, making the accusations that they did. They thought they were doing the right thing in the eyes of the adults. They were praised for saying certain things and as a child, praise obviously equals good. They thought they were doing the right thing. They now say they have no recollection of any kind of satanic cults or abuse in their childhoods. The satanic panic as it was in the 80s slowly tapered to an end, but of course you're always going to have religious people who believe in the devil, that isn't going to go away. I mean you'll still find people now who don't let their children read Harry Potter because it's witchcraft. And that was a huge story in itself back in the early 2000s when the books were being released. A lot of people were saying it was satanic. A more recent example of satanic outrage that pops to mind is the Lil Nas X music video for Call Me By Your Name. The drama that that video caused, although drama that I'm sure was intended to happen. Christian conservatives claim that Lil Nas X had gone too far with the video showing him twerking in the lap of Satan. The video is a comment on homophobia within the Christian community. If you tell us we're going to hell for being gay, then I'm going to outrage you by doing just that. But the outrage it caused showed that satanic panic isn't just a thing of the past, there are still people very concerned about it even now, and if you're religious, that makes sense. But don't go thinking that this isn't something that can happen again. Moral panics such as this one are still happening all the time, and some argue that the panic is still alive and thriving through QAnon. If you've ever delved into that terrifying side of the internet, you may well have seen QAnon theories that democratic politicians and celebrities kidnap children and kill them and use their blood for satanic rituals. There's always got to be a perpetrator of the abuse, and whilst it was daycare workers in the 80s, now it's Democrats apparently. These QAnon believers are people who don't quite have a full grip on society today, and it's rooted in far right American politics. And before I get attacked, no, I do not believe that if you're conservative or right wing that you're a QAnon conspiracy believer, but it's indisputable that QAnon is rooted in far right politics. I'm just a messenger here. The biggest difference here is that the satanic QAnon theories have their roots in politics rather than religious fear, although they kind of overlap. As Lawrence Wright, a Pulitzer Prize winning author who wrote a book about the satanic panic, told NPR, they see themselves as heroic. And how can you be heroic in today's world? Well, you protect the children. You protect the children against this cabal that is out to turn them into sex slaves. How could there be anything more important than that? Could delve a lot deeper into that, but honestly this video is long enough now and I'm scared of QAnon. People who fully believe conspiracies like that genuinely scare me a little. But if you think that this whole conspiracy thing is something that you could never get swept up in, then perhaps realise it's easier than you think. Remember the whole Wayfair scandal that happened just last year, I think it was last year, with certain items being sold online for crazy high prices, and people thought that it was being used as child trafficking. That spread around the internet like wildfire. People who I never thought would get caught up in something like that were. Even I was concerned for a moment, and I'm quite sceptical. And you know why that is? Because as a society, we have this inbuilt caveman-esque need to protect children no matter what. You think something bad is happening to a child and you jump to their aid. The Wayfair scandal theory was debunked, explanations being that the prices on the site are largely determined by algorithms which adjust prices in real time and it's not always perfect. Plus these were industrial grade cabinets. Claims that the products had names of missing children were cherry picked. It's very common for retail stores to use names, real human names for products, and there are products on that site with high prices that didn't have name names. Bridget Carr, the head of the human trafficking clinic, told USA Today, 
I think the real answer here is that people are unwilling to see trafficking as it actually happens, yet are eagerly willing to make stuff up about it. Unfortunately, there's a lot easier ways to traffic humans and create questionable listings on a globally popular furniture website. Did you get sucked up in that Wayfair conspiracy? It happens easier than you would think, even to the most rational of adults. It's easy to see why a religious person would have got sucked up in the satanic panic. So there you go, the satanic panic. Honestly, when I started planning this video, I did not think I'd have as much to talk about as I have, but it turns out this is a subject that goes incredibly deep, and really, I've only just scratched the surface in this video. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you found this interesting, and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.